And we're back with our political panel. Molly Ball is with The Atlantic. David Ignatius is a columnist with The Washington Post. Ben Dominich is the publisher of The Federalist, and Ed O'Keefe covers politics for The Washington Post. Ed, I'll start with you. So Ben Carson and these stories about his, his autobiography, is this a threat or a gnat to be swatted away? I think he thinks it's a gnat to be swatted away. I think his opponents, as Mr. Trump demonstrated this morning, certainly plan to seize on it to some extent. I'm kind of fascinated by his response to all this, however. I mean, the idea that presidential candidates, especially those that suddenly start to do well, don't get vetted, don't get scrutinized a lot more. He's clearly struggling, I think, with this. And the suggestion that others have not gone through this, uh, you know, ignores history. I think if you go back to Gary Hart, Joe Biden, Bill Clinton, certainly President Obama, Herman Cain last time, this happens. And the real test is sort of how do they respond to this? Can they change the subject? Or does it ultimately, you know, derail their candidacy? Well, in, in the case of his backstory, though, this isn't a central claim at the heart of it, right? I mean, his story is from poverty to famed neurosurgeon. The, the West Point is a little bit of a sideshow. It is. Well, and I think, I think Ed is right that the idea that a candidate would be vetted is not at all outrageous. But Ben Carson has won this round. I think there is no doubt. I think the fact that he had a plausible explanation for the West Point thing, uh, even if there was a, maybe a minor exaggeration, the, the original story did not hold up to scrutiny. And frankly, I think a lot of people want to see Ben Carson be tested because he hasn't been in politics before. Even if you support him for his story and for his beliefs, you want to know that he can handle a little bit of scrutiny. And so far, he is handling it, I think, pretty pretty deftly. You know, you got under his skin, I thought, a little bit in that interview. He started to seem a little irritated. But for the most part, this is a man who keeps his cool. Yeah, Ben, he's raised a lot of money yeah. off of this. I mean, you in, you could argue that you basically couldn't design a better thing as a primary candidate. I mean, he gets to say, the press is after me, which keeps him from being asked questions again, and he gets to raise money off it. So as Molly says, he looks like he's won this yeah, round. I make it a general policy not to disagree with Molly uh, unless I think about it very seriously, and I agree with her in this case. I think this, inc this absolutely benefits Ben Carson. He is a candidate, of course, who is basing his entire campaign on his biography, on this narrative about his life. The one problem in the long term for candidates like that is that when that is the only basis they have, when they don't have the political career and record to uh, shift the conversation to whenever questions are raised about their biography, as we've seen in the past with other candidates, it gives them uh, less of an alternative point to make. I think in this case, uh, the mistake was a media entity going after a candidate, uh, basically saying that he was lying about something that he had never ex said exactly in those terms, and I think it, uh, it was therefore overplayed and certainly accrued to his benefit in the short term when it came to raising money. David, I, I talked to Dr. Carson about experience. And he, he wrote his supporters this week and said, you know, the signers of the Declaration of Independence didn't have a lot of experience. From a national security perspective, we're having a conversation this campaign about does a senator have better experience, does a governor. But now you've got two people running, uh, three, I guess, if you include Carly Fiorina, without any of that experience. Give me your sense of what the test is. Can they just walk into the job of the president and have they, enough advisors? They shouldn't. The purpose of this period of the campaign is for hard questions to be asked in debates, in pieces of journalism that really dig of these, of these candidates. It, unfortunately, this sometimes becomes the gotcha primary where instead of asking the fundamental question, is this person qualified, does this person have a vision about national security or anything else, we instead focus in the media on small inconsistencies, gaffes, things we dig out 20 years ago. Eh, people get, get angry at that, but the fundamental work of asking, what would this person do as president? What really are their views? That's, that's what we need to really focus on. I hope we won't be pushed back by Ben Carson complaining about our, our, our questions and vetting, because that's, that's a key job. But David, isn't there a problem here that has emerged that's not so much due to the media as it is due to the priorities of the people themselves? I mean, right now, we just saw Donald Trump go yeah. on and demonstrate the qualities that one needs to be commander in chief in the modern era, which is an ability to dance to Drake and an ability <laughs> to send out particularly funny tweets. I mean, you know, frankly, if your attitude is that you're fine with the government offering people bread and circuses, you might as well hire the guy who seems like Barnum and Bailey. This is the sort of thing that I think is as much driven by the demand of the people for entertainment as it is the media actually asking questions here. If you really wanted to dig into policies uh, related to what Ben Carson uh, thought about uh, TPP or about trade, about, about foreign uh, relations or the like, that's probably going to get a lot less attention at this stage than asking him something about the pyramids. In the, in the end, it's going to come down to voters. 
and if voters are satisfied with the kind of uh, hucksterism that some candidates have or the ability to be a great reality TV st star, that's going to be decisive in the primaries. We'll see the numbers soon. Uh, a lot of me thinks it won't be, but uh, you know, we've never had a primary season quite like this, I have to say. You know, one of the candidates, Ed, who hopes that the conversation will move back towards the serious business of governing is Jeb Bush. So he has got a, been trying to reboot this week. He's had a, a, a bus tour. He's t had done a lot of interviews, um, talked compellingly about his daughter's uh, struggle with addiction. Where, and there's a debate coming up with, with the Republicans, where does the Bush campaign stand and is this debate, uh, you know, make or break for him? I think it is another make or break moment. I think the last one certainly broke him a little bit. Um, you know, and he's, he slid farther back. He is no longer center stage. He is in single digits nationally and in these early states, despite spending millions of dollars. Last week was reboot. This coming week, I think, is even more critical because it's can you can you keep to this new theme? Can you can you remain as disciplined and as on message as you were last week? His campaign is downsized. Uh, there's no doubt that, that staffers have taken pay cuts. It's, they've parted ways with others. They've reassigned a bunch to the early states. But this is still a guy who wants to be everywhere as much as possible. And the question will be, can he really focus relentlessly, solely, on places like New Hampshire, maybe South Carolina, a little bit in his home state of Florida, and just keep doing that circuit. John Kasich, Chris Christie proved that if you focus on one place and one place only, your numbers will rise and potentially sparks will fly and you'll do well everywhere else.